the revenge of the old economy, the companies that are going to be successful in the next 10 years are radically different. Right? We've taken a 90 degree turn in where the economic landscape is today and who the winners are and who the losers are going to be. Anybody, anybody who thinks the last decade is going to reappear, that's financial predictable because it ain't coming back. That was an anomaly, and that anomaly is gone. And if you're holding on to that, you are in denial, and you're going to lose a whole bunch of money. And a lot of capital has been misallocated based on those assumptions that that was the new norm. And one of the great examples I love about the inefficiency of the market, anybody thinks the market's efficient, I don't know what the hell they're looking at for the last 25 years. What's happened is, is three years ago, when interest rates start to tick negative here, the concept was, well, maybe it makes sense. After all, in Europe, there's 14 trillion, 17 trillion of negative interest rates. It must make sense. It exists. No, it was irrational. It made no sense. As a value investor, I realized I am really a growth investor, because that's what I'm looking for, companies that have significant growth ahead of them. And that's probably a recovery of that business. And I also realized that the macroeconomics is really critical. Right? Why value has underperformed for the last 12 years is the abnormal situation and the distortions that that's created. No, the Fed is not, cannot overrule the market. And the market is what, and what sucked inflation out of the world was not Volcker. It was China that sucked inflation out of the world. China sucked jobs, industries, and inflation out of the world, right? So Ross Perot had it wrong. That great sucking sound was not. Mexico. It's been China for a long time, right? China's a net importer today. Many things they probably were self-sufficient in the past. You know, steel, they have to import all the critical uh, variable costs, iron ore, met coal, energy, They're not, and, and they do that in a blast furnace, so therefore they create a huge amount of pollution. So China's very different. The population's rolled over. The wage rates are much higher in China today. So all the elements that made them so cost-effective aren't the same today. But its role in the world's economy, which clearly is the most important thing in the last 30, 40 years, the role of China in the world. And so it's changed. It's got a different role today, and it's not going to suck inflation out. If anything, it's going to feed inflation into the world for a multitude of reasons. Yes. And so, and you have that now today. You have the Saudis saying, I cannot increase production. And yet you have a deaf ear on the part of people to be like, oh, no, 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 I'm sure you can, I'm sure you can. You can't. They're telling you that. More importantly, they're showing you that, right? Last year, the spending by the Saudis was up 60%. What they say is, for the next five years, we will keep spending at that level. What we hope at the end of that five years is we'll take production from 12 million barrels a day to 13 million barrels a day. So North America, we think, of course, is a great place to invest in the next decade, right? Because, you know, I'm talking about energy and the critical role that energy plays. North America is different than the rest of the world, or the rest of the developed world. Right? Middle East has plenty of this stuff too. The fact of the matter is, we're in the middle of the largest economy in the world. And so therefore, we have an, a huge advantage because you can't move natural gas. We are long natural gas for the next decade. Therefore, energy prices in North America are competitively advantaged against the world. Did you hear me say that? If you're an industrial business, you want to be in North America because you're competitively advantaged against the rest of the world. Oh, you don't want to invest because we're going to have a recession. I'm like, what, what, what are you talking about? The economy that matters in the world is China. China's been in a recession for two years. So it, we already are in a recession. If we go into, yeah, there's a little bit of a, a, you know, a negative impact, but that doesn't last long. If you've got a three to five year time horizon, what that means is there'll be further underinvestment in these things that are critical, that are in short supply and high demand, and therefore opportunities and assets are substantially mispriced. The market is particularly bad at valuing any asset that his cash flow is not so good today because it only can evaluate cash flows. It doesn't understand asset value. It doesn't believe I can buy this asset for a tenth of what it would cost to replace. That's not a great investment. The economic resources in full demand today, and you can see the future. And if you can't see the demand for all of those things going up, including you know, reshoring and, and moving to new places, means you gotta build out infrastructure in all these other countries. What happens when Southeast Asia and India have economic development? So when economic development happens, that means energy consumption increases. So you actually get yourself in a little bit stuck in a, in a bind. And so if you had a 40-year juggernaut in the bond market, that's over. Fixed income is still mispriced. It's based on hope. It's, fixed income is based on the hope that inflation comes down to something like 2.5%. I just don't see that possibly happening given all the inflationary pressures before you talk about the fact that governments have ramped up their balance sheets tremendously because it's no inflation that's come from that. It's come from energy, it's come from fertilizer, it's come from fundamental uh, products.